Hello, welcome along, welcome back. It's a brand new episode of the smartest show in the universe. This is the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. Thank you for finding us, for following us. This is, I mean, it's the greatest podcast in the history of the universe. I've got two awards to prove it. And thank you very much for all your very kind messages congratulating us on the recent award that we just won a few weeks ago. We try and search out all the secrets lurking around the galaxy. Anything to do with science, we'll talk about it here. Uh, This week, you can learn all about one of the most cruel, creepy crawlies ever. Uh, Also, you can hear what Boaty McBoatface is up to and why there might be a new business park in space. And I've got your questions, as always. This week, it's on animal noises, on cling film, and the little rubbers on the end of your pencils. There you go. We cover everything. Let's get into it first, though, with our favourite genius on the show. This is Professor Hallux. Professor Hallux Builds a Body is produced by Fun Kids, with support from the Wellcome Trust. Again, laboratory lovers, I'm Nurse Nanobot, and it's time to join Professor Hallux again as he continues his quest to build a body. I'm here in his lab, and it's like a collision in a chemical factory. There are bubbling jars with steam pouring out of the top, banks of blackboards with baffling equations scribbled all over, and vats of powders and gunk in all the colours of the rainbow. What a mess! Brainbox Professor Hallux has been working really hard on his body. It already has a sensational skeleton, smooth skin, muscles, eyes, ears and even a tizzy tasting tongue. But there is plenty left to do. What's the plan today, Prof? Thanks, Nurse Nanobot, and welcome back to my exciting experiment to build a body. He's really taking shape, it's true. And today we're adding the choppers, the gnashers, the fangs, all the pearly whites, all of which means the teeth. They're brilliantly handy things helping you to eat and talk. Back to work. Over to you, nurse. Without your teeth, people might struggle to understand you. Teeth help you say lots of letters, like S. Without teeth, it would sound more like th. And that would sound very silly. (laughs) Your teeth might look smooth and white. But there is a lot going on under the surface. The bit you can see poking up from your pink gums is called the crown. It has a tough enamel coating, which is like a shield, protecting what's underneath. A bit like the crown on the head of a king protects him from things falling on him from above. Not quite, Prof. Dentin is the next layer below the crown and is also hard protecting the squidgy pulp where the nerve endings and blood supply run. These sensitive parts are what cause toothache when a tooth has been injured. And golly gosh! Can you tell when something has reached the pulp? It can be agony! And that pulp goes right down through the tooth into the jaw under your gum where it melds with a substance called cementum which sticks it all down. But this all just concerns your permanent teeth Tell them about baby teeth, nurse, whilst I mould the crown over this pulp. You might have lost a tooth or a few teeth by now, and maybe you've left them under your pillow for the tooth fairy. If you're lucky, maybe she left some money for you. You get your first set of teeth, about 20 of them, when you're a baby. They arrive one at a time, which is why babies have gappy toothy grins. By the time you're five or six... They're ready to be replaced by your big teeth, which start pushing them out of the way. And that's why your baby teeth start falling out and you get a gappy, toothy grin all over again. It certainly keeps the tooth very busy. And the big bonus is you gain about eight teeth at this point, which means there are more to brush, but they also help you to eat a wide range of food. I have to make sure my body has a fine set of permanent teeth. They'll be with him until he dies, so I must make a good job of it. Now, must get them in the right order. Not all teeth are the same, you see. That's right. The front teeth are called incisors. 
Their job is to cut food cleanly into chunks. Chomping apples in particular is just the sort of thing for which incisors are perfect. On either side of the incisors, you have four canine teeth. One on each side, on each row. They're especially pointy and help tear food up. Canine means dog, and dogs have very long canine teeth. <coughs> Down, Rover! <coughs> Next to your canine teeth are your premolars. You might have to stretch your mouth open a bit to see them in the mirror. There are eight of these, four at the top and four at the bottom. They're flatter and bumpier and great for grinding and chewing. Finally, you have molars right at the back. These are even rougher and bigger. They're the best for mashing food up, so it's easy for your tongue to sweep into a gulp. Ah, but don't forget the last teeth of all are the wisdom teeth. They're extra big teeth right at the back, which you only get when you're old and wise. Sometimes, though, they stay under the surface and never come out at all. The theory goes that they're left over from the Stone Age, when we would have eaten a lot more rough stuff. Horrible old anatomy fact. Over the centuries, in the years before fillings, if a tooth was bad, the only thing to be done was to pull or knock it out. Primitive man used a mallet to smash them out. Then special forceps and lances were designed to make it less messy. The ancient Chinese dentists did something a bit different, though. They trained their fingers to be strong enough to pull teeth out by practising with nails in wood. Quite a clever trick. Clever, all right, but I wouldn't let them practise on me. Over the last few hundred years, Barbers used to perform surgery like tooth extraction. That's why they have red and white striped poles outside. It's to represent blood and bandages. Look out for the pole next time you go for a haircut. Right, nearly done. Now to give my body's teeth a really good scrub. Keeping your mouth clean is very important. That's right. Bacteria love a dirty mouth. And they love sugar or food deposits. If you don't clean your teeth often enough, when you run your tongue over your teeth, they'll feel fuzzy. That's plaque. The bacteria's playground. Yuck! Leave it long enough and the acidy plaque will eat into the hard crown and right down to the pulp. And as well as looking very black and yucky, ouch! They will really hurt and might need a filling. That's when the dentist has to drill out the bad parts to mend with a type of cement. Don't worry, dentists are nice and give you a special medicine to totally numb your mouth, so you shouldn't feel a thing. But to make sure you don't need to have fillings, remember to give your teeth a really thorough brush twice a day for at least two minutes and make sure you see a dentist regularly and eat lots of crunchy veg instead of sweets. It's kinda on your chompers. Now to get flossing. And rinse. Right, my amazing body has a perfect set of pearly whites all ready for biting and chewing some tasty treats. Let's let the lightning loose! It's worked! He's giving me a big cheesy smile of lovely white teeth so I think he's happy with his gnashes. That's my work done for today. Join me next time when I'll be nailing on a niftastic nose so my body can have a sniff of something saucy. Hope you can join me and Nurse Nanabot then. Professor Hullock's Builds a Body is produced by Fun Kids with support from the Welcome Trust. Let's get to your questions then. Uh, my favourite part of the show, where I get to do all the digging. You hear a problem, maybe it's something you've heard uh, at school, something your teacher's told you and you thought, mm, really? 
I need to check with Dan about that one. Maybe it's something you heard in the playground and you thought, look, there is no chance that can be true, but I'll check with Dan anyway. You can do that. Let me find it out for you. Just leave it as a review over on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Ella has done that. She's in Ireland. Hello, Ella. Uh, she wants to know, why do different animals make different noises? I can't believe I've never thought of this before. Why do uh, goats bleep? Uh, it's because of two things. How they look and what they've learned. Now, the way sounds sound is because of the physical features of a creature, how big their throat is, what their voice box kind of thing is like, how the air moves around their tongue, around their mouth, how it comes out to make a sound, what part of their body they use to make a sound. Uh, also, it's because of what they've learned. Think of it like this. There is millions of animals around the planet. It would be useless if every creature made the same noise. They wouldn't be able to tell each species apart. So much like us humans have learned different languages because of where we've grown up around the world, it's the same with different animals. Cows have learned to move through history. Uh, dogs have learned to bark. Birds to squawk throughout the life of their species so they can communicate with just them. So other creatures don't know what they're up to and also no one gets confused. Ella, that's why different animals make different noises. This is from Carice, Charisse, Carice and Charlotte who are in Wilmslow, which is in Cheshire. Very fancy part of the world, you two. Uh, they want to know, why does cling film stick to some things but not to others. Now, cling film sticks because of electrons. They're tiny little things that make up atoms. They make up the atoms that make cling film. Now, when you peel back cling film, when you unroll it, when you first get it, it loses some electrons, which means things are a bit out of order. It wants them back. So when it finds something that has electrons that maybe it wants, it sticks to it, it clings it, which has got the opposite electrical charge, so it can get the electrons back that it wants. Now, that's a, like, it's a pretty detailed, complicated answer, that's, but that's pretty much what happens. I've tried to do it as quickly as possible for you. Uh, here is uh, Rebecca in Scotland, lastly, who wants to know, how do rubbers rub out pencil marks on paper? Everyone thinks that pencils are made out of lead. They're not made out of lead. They've been, they haven't been made out of lead for hundreds of years. Uh, your pencil is actually made of something called graphite. That's what draws the lines when you run it along a sheet of paper. And it's really easy why rubbers work. The eraser on the end of your pencil, it's basically stickier than the paper. So when you move that rubber over the page, the molecules of graphite are absorbed by the rubber and they lift off the page. Just stickier. That's what happens. Thank you very much for the question, Rebecca. If you want something answered on the Science Weekly next week, you need to leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly this week. Uh, talking about one of, I guess, one of the funnest jobs you could probably have in the world of science. We're speaking to Michelle Hicks. She's the founder of Firefly Creations. She is a roller coaster designer. She does the whole thing. She joins us. Michelle, hello. Hi, it's great to be here. When you very, at the very first time you start designing a roller coaster, how do you know what it needs to be? Are you talking to theme parks and they say, we'd like a ride that's a bit like a dragon? Or are you kind of having ideas yourself and pitching it out there? So, so there's a bit of a mixture, really. It's a bit of a joint effort where we're looking at what, what are the existing mix of attractions within a theme park? What do they have already? And how can we really build on that portfolio. So looking at what is the target audience? Are we looking at younger children? Are we looking at teenagers? And how does that storytelling fit around the rest of the theme park? And what we're finding is that is that more and more, we really want to take guests on a journey and really immerse them into a world. And really the roller coaster or any kind of ride system becomes that part of that mechanism really to tell the story and to take them on that journey. So when you've decided on the theme on the journey that you're taking people on what's the first thing that you think about with the actual making of the roller coaster is it how many twists it's going to have what the drops are going to be just just take me through how you first start off 
Well, it's all really links back to that audience and how sort of thrilling we want the roller coaster to be. But one of the first things we'll look at is actually what type of roller coaster is it? So you can have roller coasters where the train is above the track, as you'd sort of typically expect, or it can be hanging underneath the track, even at the side of the track with rotating cars. There's so many sort of different options out there. So we pick what type of experience it is. And then we start to choreograph the ride layout alongside the experience. So are we having special effects go off? Like we could have fire blasts at one point, we could have smoke coming out, all really to add that additional excitement to the ride itself. I play a lot of uh, computer games where I design roller coasters and it mainly boils down to how many loops can I fit into it. Um, When you're designing a roller coaster, what are your ambitions with what you want it to be? Not just with the storytelling side of things. Uh, are, are you trying to scare someone that's on it to with an inch of their life? Do you want to make them exhilarated and thrilled? How much does that all come into it? That's a huge part of it and, and how we want guests to feel on that experience. And there's ways that you can design a roller coaster where it can be extremely tall and extremely fast, but we don't necessarily want to completely scare guests. We want them to have a great time and come off laughing and, and, and sort of be sharing that experience with friends and family. But then at the same time, we could have another roller coaster where we really build up the anticipation of you might be going up a lift hill slowly before you slowly round a corner and you go down this enormous drop. And you're really sort of, as you say, trying to scare the pants off people as much as possible. And a lot of that comes down to what we do around the roller coaster as well with um, what does it sound like? What's the audio and and what are we telling people before they get on the ride? And it's really those emotions that play a huge part into what the overall experience is. And then we design the sensations around that. So looking at the forces that people are experiencing on the ride um, and how intense that is to really match that experience. Scientifically, what do you have to think about when you're making a roller coaster? You mentioned forces just there. Uh, how do you balance the physics of making a roller coaster with also wanting to tell the story? So we want to thrill people. And and if it's a really big, scary roller coaster, we want to thrill them as much as possible. But there are limitations. And we also want to make sure it's a, a comfortable ride because otherwise people won't be able to enjoy it. So we work a lot with um, G-forces, which despite the name are actually accelerations, but they're the the forces that you feel when you go around a roller coaster. So you could have a positive G-force and that makes you feel heavier. So if you have a force of 3G, for example, it makes you feel three times heavier. And that's the kind of thing you'll feel as you're at the bottom of the drop about to go into a big loop. And we also have negative G-forces, which make you feel a lot lighter. So as you're going over the crest of the hill, you'll come up out of your seat. And that's sort of a really thrilling sensation, Um, as well as lateral G-forces. And they're the forces you'll feel as you're pushed around a corner and almost like pushed out of your seat um, as you go around a corner quickly. So it's really that combination of forces to create those sensations we want, but also making sure within the limitations of of what humans can comfortably tolerate so they can enjoy that experience. And that's really key. We don't want people coming off going, I don't want to do that again. It wasn't fun. We want them to be laughing. We want them to be screaming with their friends and, and having a good time. You're talking about limits there. These things are always pushed We always want to see how far we can go. I know you want people to have a good time, but how much of, as a roller coaster designer, how much do you want to break boundaries and do stuff that's never been done before? There's always a certain element of uh, going taller and faster. And there's been a constant sort of competition between theme parks to see um, who is the tallest and fastest. However, we are seeing less of that now because we're getting to the point that you get so fast and you almost don't notice you're going any faster. So it is becoming more about how do we add to that experience through the storytelling. And we also, of course, have to think very, very carefully about safety, um, the limitations of forces being one thing, but also making sure anything we're designing um, is 100% safe. And that's always at the front of our minds with everything that we're doing. How do they break so quickly? There's a number of different braking mechanisms that can be used. When you get to the really fast roller coasters, uh, it tends to be magnetic braking systems. So basically, as the roller coaster goes through the brakes, it it creates a a repelling force and that slows the car down. And it's also um, really effective because you don't have the moving parts you would that you have um, if you had a 
a brake that was actually pinching the brake fin- fins attached to the car. So it also helps from a maintenance perspective, but it, it can slow us down a lot more quickly and a lot more smoothly as well, so that it's a, a slower deceleration that means that it's more comfortable for our guests. And then the opposite of that, how are some rides able to go faster and faster and faster in such a shorter time? I was on one at uh, Thought Park uh, fairly recently. Um, and all it is, is you go really quick, really high, and then you come back down. That's pretty much it. But the joy is how suddenly you're switching to an incredibly high speed. I think that's got something to do with magnets as well. Uh, how does it work? How are magnets making you reach those top speeds insanely quickly? So there's there's a couple of ways we can really achieve those really quick accelerations that gives you that real thrill as you're kind of propelled forwards. Uh, So you're absolutely right. Magnets is one way we do that. And that works in the opposite way to the brakes, as you'd imagine, in that it's creating a force that's pushing the car forward. Again, it means that we don't have the moving parts. It's a great way to be able to go really, really fast um, whilst reducing the maintenance requirements, which is obviously a, a key part of what we're doing when we're designing roller coasters. The other way you can do it is you physically attach a cable to the car itself that's on a winch and that winch spins really, really quickly and it launches the vehicle off and then it detaches from uh, the point at which it connects to the car and it sends it off on its journey around the roller coaster track. So as technology develops, we're really looking at all these different ways we can push roller coasters to the limits and get them faster than ever before and get that acceleration that is really, really exciting to people experience the riding, experience the ride. Uh, Why are people sick when they're on roller coasters? How much can you tell us about that? So roller coasters can be disorientating. It very much depends on the type of ride uh, and the type of movement. So some people get seasick when they're on a boat, for example. And the reason that happens is because their head is telling them they're static, but they're feeling that they're moving on the ship. Now, the advice is if you start to feel seasick, you go and look somewhere you can see that movement. And that means that you're, what you're feeling and what your head is seeing is matched. And it's very much the same on a roller coaster. So when people close their eyes, it's the worst thing to possibly do because you're adding to that disorientation. So if you keep an eye on where you're going, you're far less likely to feel sick. Um, And and it's all to do with the movement, how much you're spinning around and and really your sense of balance and direction. Fries my brain a little bit because there's no way that you can see and feel that you're moving quite as much as being on a roller coaster. So the fact that your brain and your ears and your eyes can can confuse that is 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 pretty strange. Listen, as a um, as a roller coaster designer, uh, bringing all the elements together, what is your, I guess, your top ambition for the ultimate roller coaster that you'd like to make? Oh, that's a very good question. I think actually, the more I'm working on roller coasters, the more I'm getting excited about the new technologies and the possibilities we have with the likes of artificial intelligence and augmented reality and how we can take the traditional roller coaster experience where you're you're strapped in, you may be launched or you go up a lift hill and you go around a track really, really fast. We can now add other elements to that. So we could have a roller coaster that responds to how loud you're screaming, for example, and you get a different experience each time, depending on who you're riding with and how they're reacting. And we can even uh, have overlays with the likes of augmented reality glasses, where not only you're on a roller coaster, but you have these aliens attacking from every direction. So you've really got the sensation of being on the ride, plus another element, which really, really excites me for the possibilities of what we can do with roller coasters in the future. You know, those virtual reality, you know, those simulating rides that you can get where you sit down and it's in like a little robotic uh, holder and you move from left to right like you're on a plane you know those ones I, I'm, I'm worried that that's all that roller coasters are going to be in the future with VR with augmented reality that really you're not going to go anywhere but I, I love getting winched up really high plummeting really fast down low I want to move when I'm on a roller coaster is that something that you see happening that really in the future you won't move anywhere with rides No, I I think there is always going to be a place for physical sensations for exactly the reason you say. There is, no matter how good virtual reality is uh, and how well the simulators sort of match that movement, it's never the same as actually being up 200 feet in the air and dropping down on a roller coaster. 
And at the same time, you also have the element of being there with your friends and family and enjoying that experience together. And when you're in this sort of digital world, that's far more difficult. So I think both because of the physical sensations you get on an actual roller coaster and also because it's far easier to enjoy those sensations with your loved ones, then we're, we're not going to see an end to the physical ride experiences. We may see the virtual alongside that as a different kind of experience, and that's OK. But the two, I think, complement each other and will never replace each other, which is a very good thing. And lastly, there's nothing more annoying than when you're in the queue for a ride uh, and you've been there for like 30 minutes or maybe it's the one ride that you've actually gone to the theme park to see and then you kind of see the lights dip down low and the person walks down the aisle and says everybody off we've broken down we need to have some time why do roller coasters break these these colossal feats of engineering that cost loads of money why do they still break so it, it, I, I've experienced that feeling many times and it unfortunately does happen. However, you have to think about uh, the roller coaster is a very complex piece of machinery. So much like a car, it needs, um, it needs care and it needs attention to keep it working. So what every roller coaster will do, it will um, stop in a fail safe position. So if there's anything that's not quite right that the machine has censored, uh, the machine has sensed, then it will sort of stop itself whilst everything is checked. And that is done to ensure it's always operating safely within the limits of the design. So um, I think once you've worked on the design of them and you know how complex these rides are, you become a little bit more patient when people are, are working through these issues. Um, but the, the best thing is to know that it will be up and running very, very soon uh, and you can enjoy that experience. Experience. Uh, amazing. Uh, so many questions answered. Michelle, thank you for coming on the show. You are very welcome. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Now, this week's Dangerous Dan is all about a very cunning and cruel creepy crawly. The orchid mantis is an insect. It's got a long neck, it's got buggly eyes. They look a little bit like they've got the head of an alien, and they're a smooth pink colour for a very good reason. They hide on the orchid flower, which just happens to be that same smooth pink colour. And their bodies and their joints, they look a little bit like a grasshopper. They're quite sharp and they stick up weirdly at odd angles. So they blend in with the sharpness of the flower pretty well. It's the perfect camouflage technique. Uh, they don't just do it to blend in, but also because their bright colour attracts prey. Bees will fly over stunned by the pink, maybe thinking it's a flower, maybe just being dazzled by the bright colours itself, and then the orchid mantis will quickly strike, leaping out and getting some lunch. Now it's this, this, this twisted take. It's cruel, it's mean, it's perfect for Halloween. It's hunting, blending in perfectly and brightly, going unnoticed right in front of a prey's eyes, all of that. Make it perfect for the orchid mantis to go straight on our Dangerous Dan list. Let's catch up with one of our favourite gadget geniuses on the show. This is Techno Mum. Techno Mum, engineering explorers. It's the swimming gala today. Pity I came second to last in my race. I wish I was as fast as my friend Ryan. He can clear one whole length in 30 seconds. I think he's secretly a dolphin. <laughs> hey, why so sad? I thought you did brilliantly. Nice try, Mum. I was terrible. What I need is someone to invent turbo flippers. Or, I don't know, underwater rocket glasses. So what you need is a marine engineer. A marine engineer? Marine engineers design and build things which will operate in water. So that might mean at sea, in a river or reservoir, even in a swimming pool. One of the oldest types of marine engineering is naval architecture. That's designing watercraft. Watercraft? Y you mean boats, right? There's more to watercraft than boats. For starters, boats come in all shapes and sizes, from a small dinghy to a huge cargo ship. And then there are submarines and exploration vessels which travel to the deepest depths of the sea. And don't forget the turbo flippers. Naval architects will figure out the best way for these vessels to be propelled, which means thinking about power and engine design. Watercraft need to be able to change directions and stop, so naval architects will design steering systems and understand how anchors work. They also need to make sure that the vessels are safe and comfortable places in which people can travel and work. Things can behave very differently at sea, so they need to have studied hard to learn the effect that water has on machinery and materials. Yeah, no one wants a rusty boat. Then you've got the oceanic engineers. 
Oceanography is the study of oceans themselves, including things which live in them. Scientists in this field use lots of equipment to gather and analyse samples and take readings. That equipment has to be able to cope with the demands of a watery workplace. And marine engineers are the experts. Cool! Imagine you could travel to the bottom of Loch Ness and find the monster. <laughs> and in case you think marine engineering is just bobbing around in boats or slipping into underground caves, check out this video. This is the Royal Navy's Griffin hovercraft. It's used in combat and for search and rescue missions. As you can imagine, it's a really complex vessel and learning to operate it can take months. Yeah, you wouldn't want to crash that by accident. Well, this is where engineers have put their heads together. Software engineers at Birmingham University have been working with marine engineers to capture video from the hovercraft as it carries out its duties. This is then used in virtual reality simulators back on dry land to help train people up before they get on board. You see, if I had one of those, I'd definitely have beaten Ryan in the freestyle. And been disqualified. Cool job, though. It's just one of loads of cool jobs in engineering. Engineering Explorers, created with support from the Institution of Engineering and Technology to celebrate the Year of Engineering. Find out more at focuslive.com slash technomum. It's time for this week's Science in the News. The UK's new polar research ship, the RRS Sir David Attenborough, a.k.a. Boating McBoatface, before they decided they didn't want to call it that, uh, it's in London, it's ready to undertake her first expedition. She's parked up by Greenwich, the home of time, to show off to everyone how massive it is before it uh, sails to the South Pole, I think. I saw her the other day, I walked past. She is enormous. Also, this is interesting, a search to find a key part of the universe has failed. Scientists have been looking for this tiny subatomic particle, it's called a sterile neutrino. The problem is, most ideas for how the universe started was built on the fact they thought this particle existed, but they can't find it, so that means scientists are going to have to get thinking and maybe come up with some new ideas about the building blocks of why we're here. Also, uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon and Blue Origin, the space company, has announced plans for a space business park. It'll be called Orbital Reef. He hopes to make films up there to do research and also to have a hotel in space. It will hold 10 people and he wants it to be up there in a few years' time. That is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can never miss an episode, by the way, if you follow us wherever you get your podcasts from. If that place is on Apple Podcasts, leave us a question there as a review. Dead easy. Find the Science Weekly. Let me know your name. Give us five stars so I'll see it. There's a little comment box at the bottom. That's where you put your question. Uh, while you're on there, you've got so many brilliant podcasts that we do. You can also get them on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. You can listen to us all over the country on your DAB digital radio uh, and online at funkidslive.com. See you next week.